When the Stafford East Windsor Summers co-op football team played at Ansonia Tuesday night, it marked the first state playoff game in Stafford program history. A special season and ideal timing for the bravest bulldog. Some of the images you'll see in this story are graphic, but most importantly, they're images of bravery. John Gianfrido is the bravest bulldog. When this job was open, you know, we lost 22 games in a row. There were 17 kids in the program. Detroit, I love the way those feet are moving right now. Love the way those feet Going into the season, a lot of people were telling me, you guys are going to go four and six, and you're not going to do anything. Doing something to prove people wrong and exceed expectations is the playoffs. And I'm telling you what needed to happen. We needed to meet each other. That's what needed to happen. You start winning your first couple games, and the town just goes crazy. We needed to find each other. And then somehow, we found them. Gives them something to be proud of and, and to look forward to. And I'm telling you, you belong here. I told you since 11 AM, I felt like I'm going to puke. And that's a great feeling. That's nerves. And if you're not feeling that, you're not alive for this. It was a football season like none other in Stafford history. Teamed in a co-op with Summers and East Windsor, the stand. Bulldogs earned their first ever trip to the state playoffs. Everything that you guys have been put through, tonight's your night. Let's finish this strong. I love all you guys, man. I love you to death. Let's get this done. Let's go, boys. Let's go, boys. And fittingly, it played out in the senior year, the senior season of the bravest Bulldog of them all, John Gianfrido. For every boy in high school, it's usually to do one sport, usually something. I was glad I was able to do at least something. He can't play football, so just letting him be part of it in any way, it just it makes me feel really good. Yeah. That's for you, buddy. Yeah. Oh, boy. Thank you, man. When I first started, they were on a losing streak. It was even a surprise that we would ever get a touchdown. Now this year, because we're actually winning, I'm literally straining my voice, and my music teacher, Mrs. Dillon, has warned me not to. And I'm like, I don't care. We're on a winning streak. John Gianfrido was born with a rare skin disease. Epidermolysis bullosa. An excruciatingly painful disease in which the skin is so fragile, it's compared to the wings of a butterfly. So when you rub, move, sometimes just spontaneously, you either the skin either tears or blisters. And it happens externally and it happens internally. It's not about the pain, it's just, the, well, it is about the pain, but it's just I don't want to suffer like this. To prevent infection, Brenda Gianfrido gives her son nightly baths and bandage changes. But when I do bandages and sometimes just slightly bumping him accidentally, I'm causing him pain. I have to cause him pain in order to care for him, which I think is the hardest thing to grasp as a parent. Changing John's bandages routinely takes two to three hours. A tedious process, it became a daily necessity after John spent five weeks in the hospital this summer with a MRSA infection. Five weeks that cast his future in doubt. John's just inspirational. He does everything, and I would most certainly compare John to the football season. Something that wasn't supposed to happen, happened. The main thing that triggers me is what's wrong with you. It's not the way they say, it's the way how they look at me. It's how they look. And so usually I just look at them and I'm like, try living one day in mine. Cody Desolates met Johnny in third grade. They've been friends ever since. The starting linebacker and the bravest bulldog. This isn't for show. This isn't charity. This is genuine friendship. I'm very open to say that he's my best friend. He very much so cares about me as a person as I care about him. Somebody picked on Cody, I threatened to run him over. I am not joking. Seeing a high school boy who has such a heart um, 
it makes me want to cry every time like mm. you know I talk to him and I just want to give him a big hug and he just, Cody doesn't know what it means to me when I see John in the hallways I don't want it to be I you know you're in pain I know that but it's like I want it to be yo what's up home slice you know that that's how it goes I want it I want him to be comfortable Okay. Go. So at this time we'd like to recognize all our senior players and the parents. <laughs> I'd like to thank Stabber High for such a unique opportunity. Cody Desolates will be my best friend. My best I heard that announcement, and I'd like to thank Cody Desolates for being my best friend. I heard that announcement, it really hit me. I didn't think I was doing anything special. When, you know, talking to John, I was just being me, you know? Being, being a friend to John is, is normal. It's what I've always done. For me, really happy knowing that they actually recognized me, because I didn't think they would. And the team has really embraced him and taken him in and made him feel like an actual team member and not just, oh, you know, there's a kid with his wheelchair cheering us on. I think Johnny getting to be able to be part of the winning, I think that's great. He's associated with this. You know, he goes to school on Monday and he wears his Stafford football stuff. He's excited about it. You know, the kids are excited about it. And I'm telling you what needed to happen. We needed to meet each other. That's what needed to happen. We needed to find each other. Wednesday night, the Hartford Hawks authored a surprise road win at three-time defending America East Tournament champion Albany. The Great Danes hadn't lost at home in over a year, but they did Wednesday. Second-seeded Albany falling in an America East quarterfinal to seventh-seeded Hartford. It was an exciting adrenaline rush of a night for the Hartford players. The type of night that would leave you believing that athletes talented enough to have earned college scholarships are living charmed lives full of happiness and satisfaction. But as the story of Hartford Jr. Evan Cooper shows us, that's far from a universal truth. What's not to like about the energy and excitement of college basketball? Here's Jalen Ross with the Hawks. Gets it to go. We assume the players we pay to see and support are the big men on campus, blissfully doing what almost everybody else who's ever dribbled a basketball can only dream of. People who think that being a college athlete is just all fun and games, it's far from it. I mean, it's a full-time job, it really is. After starring in high school at Texas, Evan Cooper left his family to come north for college. And come his sophomore year at the University of Hartford, his world went dark. <sighs> there was times where I didn't even want to get out of bed, I just wanted to sit there. I mean, there was countless nights, countless weeks that I just cried myself to sleep. It was just everything combined. It was just too overwhelming. What Coach John Gallagher says made Cooper stand out in high school. Enthusiasm for life. Had all but vanished in college. Just being around him, you felt it. Beset by personal problems and facing rigorous academic challenges, Cooper's future was in doubt. And even more alarmingly, his present was in doubt. I was in denial. I wasn't ready to blame myself for my mistakes. I was putting on other people. At the urging of Gallagher, Cooper made the decision to take a year off, to go home and go in search of answers. It wasn't an easy choice, but it was the correct one. If he took a year away, it could affect him for the next 30 years in a positive way. If we kept him here, we would win three or four more games, maybe, you know and he'd be, he'd be in trouble at 28. Leaving my team and knowing that I'm leaving them for a whole year was just like a dagger to the heart. Right when I got home, I mean, of course, I had to go to doctors and other things, and I finally found out that I was deeply in depression. Even as society progresses, stigmas remain. A player gets a knee injury, everybody can relate. A player battles depression, 
and hardly anyone is willing to relate, at least publicly, even when the numbers suggest that seven out of every 100 of us is dealing with depression, a number that a recent study says may be as high as 18 out of 100 for male college athletes. Evan finally was comfortable confiding in his coach when Gallagher paid a visit to Texas during Cooper's year at home. And of course, I started crying, bawling my eyes out. And he came, sat close to me, and just put his arm around me and was like, I wasn't lying when I said I was never going to leave you, never going to not bring you back to the school. It never left my mind. You're trying to go on a mission to win a championship. But 40 years from now, you'll have that relationship. We always say our goal here is to have two tables at your wedding. Uh, and I think uh, you know, when Evan gets married, uh, We'll have two tables there. Without him believing in me, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I could be playing somewhere else or who knows, not playing basketball anymore. Ahead to Thomas. Here's Thomas. No look past to Cooper. A three. It's good! Evan Cooper nails the three! Me having to go away was the hardest thing I've had to do. Evan Cooper nails the... Depression is nothing to joke around. Nothing to think that it's easy. Pushing up the floor for the Hawks. Right Going side. home it's good. was the best thing. I fell in love with the Lord and got baptized and found like a, a great church to go to called the Prayer Room and they're lifesavers. He's back to what he was. The best thing I said, how are you doing? In the beginning he said, I'm grateful. It's so difficult. I remember the time that I came out, it was by an accident. I was in the car with my mother and we were bringing a friend home and I was talking about a previous coach that I had. I was like, oh mom, she is so pretty. And she was like, I didn't say pretty, I said something else. And my mom looked at me like, driving the car, is there something we need to talk about? I was like, no, not at all. She was like, I'm not going to bite. And that was a reaction I wasn't expecting. I thought she was going to hit me or something. She was very open to it and she was like, oh, you should have told me earlier. The decision to come out for teenage athletes is fraught with anxiety. What will teammates think? What will friends think? What will family think? I told my aunt when she yelled at me. She's a Christian and she said that when she was reading the Bible, God only allowed men and women to go out, not men and men. It takes a lot of courage. I mean, then again, like there's the um, situation of coming out in schools and in sports and then it's also within the family. When I was in eighth grade, I, you know, found out that I really was into girls and I just kind of went with it and I didn't really care what anyone had to say about it. Being open on a team and being open in school I, is different. I will say that. Amber Murphy is a record holder in girls swimming at Middletown High School, currently dating a softball player at school. And there are some people who probably like will get a little squeamish if I kiss my girlfriend in the hallway or whatever, but it's like, you know what, it's high school and if you can kiss your boyfriend then I should be able to kiss my girlfriend. And it's not like I'm standing there in the hallway like making out or like ready to have sex. It's just a normal like, you know, kiss goodbye. I had to break up uh, you know, a lesbian couple just the other day in, in the hallway saying, all right, kind of, you know, time to move to class. And you don't even think anything of it. It's just, you know, it's, I would do the same thing for a straight couple. Drew, you should be telling them 180. Trevor Charles is straight, but as a teacher, coach, and the advisor to the Gay Straight Alliance at Middletown High School, he hears and sees the struggles gay athletes deal with in disclosing their sexuality. The disclosure often more complicated for a male athlete. Kids seem to think that that's undermining their testosterone level of some sort. Three passes and a shot! Lauren Davern is an openly gay history teacher and girls lacrosse coach at Capital Prep in Hartford. At a school priding itself on diversity and tolerance, Davern has been a strong role model for gay players like Kesia Lee Negron, understanding the slurs they are on occasion subjected to. When I would step on the field and I would defend a girl or I would be a t an attacker, she would say things like, you're, you're a butch, and then like dyke. And I was like, excuse me, you make no sense. Like, why would you, I know I'm gay. You don't have to tell the rest of the world. You do live with discrimination every single day uh, with, you could be, I mean, walking down the street, I, I hear things from people. Walking into uh, changing rooms, walking into bathrooms, walking into fitting rooms. I mean, I hear stuff every week. It's all in your response as to how, 
how you're going to deal with it every single day. In the spring season, Middletown High School's Calvin Dempsey runs track. In the fall and in the winter, he jumps, tumbles, and flips with the cheerleading team, the only boy on the team. Accepted by most of his fellow students, there remain situations and environments Calvin feels uncomfortable in. Normally, I don't go for gym class. I don't go in the locker room. Because then once I walk in there, people will be like, you're in the wrong locker room or something. People will say that to you? Mm -hmm. Are you hurt by when they say that? Well, I, ignore, I try to ignore it. The openness that Amber, Kesia Lee, Mark, and Calvin have all chosen may have seemed unthinkable to young gay athletes 20 years ago. Social progress has changed the landscape in many places, though certainly not all. School culture is so important, so what could be happening at Capital Prep for a child here, or a student here, an athlete here, could be very, very different a few blocks down. Every year the kids are more and more accepting because they're more and more exposed to the fact you know, and the reality that you know, gay people are, are a part of our society and that's you know, okay. And to those who keep their, I guess, like keep their business to themselves, I respect that and it's their choice. But for me as an individual, I kind of find it hard to not be myself. A growing number of gay high school and college athletes are living open lives. What we have yet to see is an active male pro athlete come out in the NHL, NBA, NFL, or Major League Baseball. I've always said that I think um, athletics is the final frontier. Um, so we're, we're sort of, you know, winning acceptance and people are understanding that in the classroom you can teach about it. But it's a different case when you're on the field. It's a different case when you're in that locker room. And I think um, that's the next place of where education needs to go. I don't doubt it will happen probably in my lifetime. Um, I, it may be 10, 15 years down the road, but uh, I don't doubt it'll happen. I mean, there's, there's a, a ton of you know, fantastically talented gay athletes out there, um, and it's just a matter of time before one you know, has sort of the courage and you know, society gets to the level of acceptance where they feel comfortable to do so. I feel like eventually there will there'll be that one person who will step up and say, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. I am who I am. You liked me when I was, you know, pretending to be straight, so why don't you like me now? What makes it any different? Who wears the pants in the East Catholic basketball family? Everybody does. At least everybody who makes varsity. Work hard, play hard, play hard, play. For us, it's great because I think it kind of links us to the past, which is nice. Luke Riley comes from a basketball family like few others in Connecticut. His brother, Joe Jr., is the head coach at Wesleyan. His late uncle Gene won 547 games coaching basketball at Portland High School. And his late father, Joe Sr., won 515 games coaching at Newington, Bloomfield, and South Catholic. Joe Sr. also won the fashion game itself. Following the lead of Bobby Knight's Indiana Hoosier teams, Joe Riley had his players warm up in candy cane pants. One of those players was his son, Luke. As a kid, I'd be riding the bus and hanging out, being the ball boy and all that. At that time, the candy canes were kind of popular, but it was always hand in hand with South Catholic and my father and his team. When Luke became the head coach at East Catholic in 2000, one thing would be certain, sartorial splendor in layup lines. When I got my own job, I said, if there's one thing that I want to do as a coach is I'm going to, we're going to carry the candy canes along with us. Upon making the varsity roster, players at East get their big boy pants having truly earned their stripes. When you get the candy canes, you basically made it. I've been coming to the games since I was like five, six years old, and we, I've always seen them when they're warming up, just the bright stripes. I mean, they're hard to miss, as you see. <laughs> when I first put them on, they were, they were crazy. Opposing student sections like to play the fashion police when it comes to the East Catholic trouser tradition. We've been laughed out of gyms as we take the court. Some people say they look like jail pants. You hear people snickering and laughing. They're like, oh, here come the inmates. We kind of look at each other and give the nod, like, hey, you know what? Like, you know, make sure we take care of business tonight. They probably think they're cool too. They're just trying to get in our heads somehow. I like them. I think they're pretty cool. I think they give us a little swagger. There's a 70s vibe to candy cane pants, which seems to fit nicely with East Catholic's throwback bus, Eagle One. We pull up and everybody knows who we are. And that's what we're about. We just want to stick out. We want to be different. We try to be very uncommon. We want our players to train in an uncommon way. We want them to act in an uncommon way and give uncommon effort. 
they've really bought into that the candy canes are one way that we're a little uncommon because you don't see them a lot. We gave a couple pairs to the, some people in our student section and they were in front row and they look, they look crazy to them but it's what we're about and it was awesome. There's an art to rocking the candy canes and a skill to taking them off without looking silly. Usually you gotta take a few of the buttons off first and then you could give it a yank or take the waist buttons off then give it a yank. The newest versions, bought three years ago, are much lighter than their predecessors. These weigh about seven or eight pounds. This was the custom pair that we had. And, uh, the weight and feel of the pants has progressed since the 70s, but the meaning behind the warm-ups has stayed on point. Tradition matters, and while everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time, not everybody earns the privilege to put these pants on one leg at a time. If we win five, six straight, I don't care how dirty they are, how bad they smell, they're staying in my bag, I'm not touching them. If we lose a game, I'll throw them in the washer just so they don't stink up everything else. East Catholic has won nine in a row. So if what Mark Carbone is saying about not washing his pants is true, that is one ripe stripe. The year was 1968, and then Jack McDonald was front and center as Waterford High School won its first ever state baseball championship. His high school playing days were coming to an end, but his association with high school sports was just beginning. I don't think you could find anybody in southeastern Connecticut that could say a bad word about Jack McDonald. As a three-sport high school official, Jack was a man for all seasons and the type of friend everybody hopes for. I went through a divorce. I might lost my dad in 2008. First person I call every time I needed to talk to somebody was Jack McDonald and he would take time, talk, meet me anywhere for a coffee, whatever. Always knew uh, why he was there as an official, what he was there for. To give the kids the best game of the, their day, because that's the game that counted. The money he, uh, he made uh, through officiating, he saved for trips to go, um, to go watch me play. Jack would coach his son John in Babe Ruth baseball, and then watch as John made it all the way to the big leagues debuting with the Cleveland Indians on July 4th, 1999. And he used to always ask me, are you having fun? Are you having fun? Because if you're not having fun anymore, you, pro you should focus on something else. About this time a year ago, Jack McDonald began feeling sick. First came a diagnosis of kidney cancer, then liver cancer. It was one of the fastest transformations of, of a cancer patient I've ever seen. Five months, looked like you. And then five months later, he was gone. In the middle of the baseball season, John's current team, the Toronto Blue Jays, encouraged him to head home and be by Jack's side. I'm not left with, um, like a lot of people I'm sure are, with a feeling in your stomach or your heart that, you know, I wish I said this one more thing. And I don't have that. In the final conversations between father and son, Jack made a request to John, knowing full well that at the time, his son had hit a total of just 13 big league home runs. I'd like you to hit your next home run for me when you cross home plate. I'd like you to point to me, point up to the sky. And, you know, I laughed. I'm like, are you serious? This is the last thing that, you know, I would expect to come out of your mouth because it's just not the way, you know, you taught me how to do things. And he said, no, I'm serious. I'm, that's what I want you to do. I said, all right, and kind of laughed and said, it may take a while. McDonald's just activated and rejoined the team yesterday. Just days after delivering his 60-year-old father's eulogy, John returned to the Blue Jays. His first game back came on Father's Day. And what happened next is enough to make you believe in magic. Long drive left field. McDonald has just hit a two-run home run. I swung real hard and got just enough of it. It might have tipped the top of the wall as it was going over. Great Father's Day in, in a sense for Johnny Mack. Uh, so happy to see him hit that home run. I almost cried myself. Did Jack reach his hand down from heaven and pull that ball over? I mean, John hits three home runs a year. The first at bat on Father's Day, full five days after his dad dies, just amazing. Wow, I got goosebumps. It gives people an opportunity to come up to you and talk about something other than directly talking about your father or you know saying they're sorry about your loss. So it gave uh, an in for um, a smile and, uh, and, a, and a hug. It just made the conversations that much easier. And for me, and, and I, I think it made, made it that way for, for a little while for my mom, too. So I think it really helped in our healing process. A very bittersweet moment for sure. The story doesn't end here. John would hit five more home runs before the season ended. 
His very next home run after Father's Day came off Red Sox left-hander John Lester, himself a cancer survivor. Then in August, a home run at Fenway Park on the same day when John had been interviewed about his dad for the Jimmy Fun Radio Telethon. Put those all together and, and you know, a lot of things happen for a reason. Um, my healing process was really made a lot easier. Feels to me like he's up there watching over me. Come on, get me one more. Here we go. Close up, box out. Being at home and just, it's different now, you know? But when you're with the team, it's, you feel more comfortable, I guess. Hey guys, a uh, couple things. Thanksgiving is about being thankful and being about family. Okay? I'm gonna get emotional because I've been around you guys as much as my family. Challenge these guys, Black, all right? Make to them fully be part of a sports right, team is to enter Somebody into an agreement to share emotions, Bam. share triumphs, and share loss. At Woodland High School in Beacon Falls, a loss hit suddenly on Saturday, January 19th. George Pino, age 48, died of a heart attack that day, and all at once the Valley lost a husband, a father, and a man who had coached local kids in everything from youth soccer to Pop Warner football, to Little League baseball, to YMCA basketball. Those kids included his sons, Jake and Jack. His latest coaching commitment was as the head freshman football coach for Woodland and an assistant come the varsity games. There's two things I love being called, that's coach and dad. I get that dad every day. When I get called coach, but you guys have been calling me coach for a long time, whether it was Pop Warner, or let me be part of your life's here. I'm never going to forget it. George gave as much to every kid in this building as he gave to his own kids. I mean, he, you would never know he had a kid on the team when he's coaching. You know, and that's important. That's a hard thing to sometimes separate. He wasn't just a coach to me. He was like a father, a best friend. Every football game, he gives speeches in the locker room, and he just talked about how much he loved all of us. George's youngest son, Jack, is a junior on the Woodland basketball team. Back with his teammates is where he found himself in the wake of his father's death. There were services to attend, awkward moments to navigate with well-meaning friends, emotions to share, and just one day after a funeral, the next game on the schedule to prepare for. All right, hold up, hold a up. A huge challenge on the road versus Waterbury's mighty Wilby High School, ranked number two in the state and undefeated. To be honest, I've never felt so nervous in my life for a game. Rami Roundtree would shake off those nerves, playing the best game of his life. He scored 30 points and grabbed 15 rebounds. And he wasn't alone in his inspired play. We were definitely playing for Mr. Penno. Great coach, great person. Jack's on our team, and we really just wanted to win for his family. Right after the first quarter, I knew. We were playing the best basketball we played all year. I kept thinking, I was like, I know it's him. Like, I, I felt it. The kids don't get enough credit for, you know, how compassionate they are to everybody, you know? I mean, they wanted to do this so much and for Jack and for his father, and they cared so much that they just played at a different level. I, I can't even describe it. That night was the epitome of, you know, you felt like somebody was watching over you. You felt like, you know, the shots when they were being taken, that everyone that left our fingertips had a good chance of going in. Right from the start, there was a sense something special was to happen for the Hawks. Jack's glances into the stands at his brother, confirming what both were feeling. We kept looking at each other and we just knew. The Woodland lead dwindling in the final minutes, Coach Tom Hunt calls for a play pulled right out of a football playbook, the one they call the Randy Moss play. With the football quarterback Kingsley airing it out to the football wide receiver Roundtree. One that the basketball team had practiced for three years but never run in a game. One that a certain fiery football coach would have approved of with great enthusiasm. You guys have taught me about courage, hard work, bravery, commitment, everything. You showed me the way. Well, that's the game that he would have went crazy for us. If he was there, he would have ran on the court with us and everything. The next morning, Coach Hunt made a call to Wilby to get the game ball. We decided as a coaching staff that uh, Jack and the Pino family should, should kind of have that ball because it was so memorable of the night. The Pino family name means something in Beacon Falls and surrounding towns. George had cemented that certainty long ago. 
and it's now a name his son embraces with more pride than ever. I don't want to take off my warm-up when I'm warming up because it just means so much to me. It's been a privilege and an honor to be part of your lives. And I don't ever want it to end. You can always count on me. This may be your last game here, but it's not the last time you're ever going to have me. I'll be there forever, whenever you need me. Because you guys have given me something that no one else can give me. I love you guys. <laughs>